Um, I just got a quick question as we get going. Again, I'm glad you're, glad you're here with us tonight. As Brian, you would have heard Brian um, lead us to a time of prayer a few moments ago as we prayed for Afghanistan and all that is going on over there. Let me just ask you a question. Raise your hand if you know the story of Najia from Faryab. Are you guys familiar with Najia? Am I no, Najia? Nobody knows Najia? Well, let me tell you the story of Najia then. Um, Najia is a middle-aged woman uh, until just a couple weeks ago, lived in the Faryab province of, um, of Afghanistan. And she was... Um, Middle-aged woman, uh, just kind of caught there in the crosshairs of the Taliban's movements and everything, and she had a knock on the door one day, and um, when she opened the door up, there's like 15, 16 Taliban members there, and they, one of the guys says, hey, you need to make us some, some food. And so this single mom, you know, of, had four kids, she, she scrounges through and kind of empties the cupboard and makes these guys some food. And they leave, and the next day, there's another knock on the door. She opens it up, same 15, 16 guys, all these these freedom fighters, as they like to call themselves, and she says, hey, you need, to, you need to make us, you know, you need to make us dinner again, right? And so, uh, so again, she just kind of pulls something together and, and makes it for them and, and then serves it to them, and they leave. And she's like, okay, good, everybody's safe again. Third day, you guessed it, same knock at the door, same men, same demands. And so she's really scraping the bottom of the barrel. She puts something on the table, they eat, they leave. Fourth day. Same knock, same men, same demand. But today was different because that day, um, Najia, she had her three sons and her one and only daughter there in the house with her. They said, hey, we want you to make a meal for us. And so Najia looks at these guys. They're all holding rifles, of course. And she says, I don't know what you expect me to do. She says, I, I'm a poor woman. I, I can't feed you. How, how do you want me to feed you? She says, how do, I, how do you expect me to feed you? And the men immediately answered her question with just vicious and savage attacks. They began to beat her, strike her, and push her. She fell down to the ground inside the house. And so the kids are screaming, the, the daughter's screaming, and everybody's kind of like, you know, what's going on? And, and they're rushing to help, but then they're being pushed back. And, and, and the daughter is, 25-year-old daughter, she's just screaming like, stop, stop, stop. And of course, they begin to strike her with the, the butts of their rifles, these heavy AK-47s. And the daughter's screaming, please stop, please stop, please stop. And the men do, just long enough to throw a grenade into the adjacent room. And he went running from the house as the house began to be engulfed in flames. Yeah, so, so Najib su surrendered to her injuries and died. She left behind four children, parentless, in a world far from our own, but right here nonetheless, that is very different from ours, and just burning. I got a question for you. Is anybody mad yet? Oh, yeah. Yep. yeah, I mean, can I just confess, like, just... Yeah, all right, hang tight. Yes, sir. So, so I just, I got to confess. Um, yeah, I've been angry the last couple of weeks. Been, been angry. And it's that dangerous kind of anger, you know, that kind of anger that, that we pa pastors call that righteous indignation, you know, that anger that'll get you in trouble, you know. And, and if you, I'll be honest with you, it ain't all that righteous. To be, I mean, sometimes I mean, I'm just dipping down beneath the, the radar of righteousness, okay? Um, I mean, because I, I see the same headlines you see, I see the same reports, I see the same news footage, I see the same reels, I see the same devastation and blood and violence in the streets, and I'm going, and that was before. That was, that was before our blood was spilled on the streets of Cabal late this week. I mean, it's the anger that, that makes me want to call up, I'm mean, just being honest with you, makes me want to call up my hillbilly cousins, okay? Be like, yo, boys, get your guns. It's, it's open season on terrorists, okay? I'm just, I'm just saying because, you know, that world-famous theologian, that great philosopher, Willie Nelson, I mean, it was he who said, take all the rope in Texas and find a tall oak tree, round up all them bad boys, and hang them high in the street. And, and I just think, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds really good because there's questions that we're asking right now that we can't answer. Like, 
There are people who know God and believe in God. They go, now God, how does this, how do you fit into this? Why are you allowing this to happen? What's this going to look like at the end? And those are the nice questions. The unnice, unfair questions, the scathing questions come from those who don't believe. And they, they say, how do you believe in a God who allows this kind of evil? I mean, where's your God in the midst of all this wickedness? Where, where's your God? Is he powerless? Is he just not loving and kind? Is he not gracious? Because if he was gracious, like you say that he is, he would do something about this, right? Where is he? And I'm going, God... They're asking questions, and we're defaming your name. And here's the deal. It, just being honest, God kind of brings it on himself. I mean, it, it, look at this. I, uh, I, Amos chapter 5, verse 24. This is, what the, this is what the God tells the prophet. He goes, let me tell you how to live. Let me tell you how to live. Quote, this is God talking. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's the standard. That's what it's supposed to look like. It doesn't look like that. And it's tough. So I, I think that maybe it might behoove us tonight to go on a search, to go on a scavenger hunt. Let's go looking for some justice. Because justice is something that should be found in God's earth, in God's kingdom, right? The fatherless should be taken care of. The weak should be defended. The humble, the meek should be protected. And that is not what's happening. In fact, all of those people are being preyed upon as we pray for them. So let's go looking for some justice. Okay, raise your hand if you know Naboth of Jezreel. Anybody? Nobody? Nobody? No, Naboth? Okay. Raise your hand if you know Abraham. Okay, good. Raise your hand if you know King David. All right, and you, we talked about Nathan last week and Nehemiah, but nobody knows Naboth of Jezreel. Uh, Sam's, I think I know him. Okay, we got one guy who thinks, okay, let me tell you the story about Naboth of Jezreel. Naboth of Jezreel, we know two things about him. He owned a vineyard and he lived next door to the wicked, evil, sinister, vile king Ahab. There you go. That's, that's all we know. There's one mention of this dude in all of God's word. One story. I'm about to tell it to you. It's in 2, 1 Kings chapter 21, okay? And so we, we don't know if the dude was married, if he had a wife, what her name was, if he had children, what, what, what his occupation was. We, we don't know if he was a righteous man or an unrighteous man. All we know, he owned a garden, and it was next door to King Ahab's place. And King Ahab goes, you know, I think I like your garden. Tell you what, you give me your garden, I'll give you a better garden, or if you just want to cash out, I'll just... I'll just pay a cash, dip into the treasury. We'll just do the, we'll do the deed right now. And Naboth, knowing what God's word says about trading and selling family land, tribal land, because he's a member of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, he goes, King Ahab, you, you know I can't sell it to you. You know I can't trade it. This was my father's, my father's father's, my father's father's father's. I, I can't do that. And so King Ahab, you know what he does? Not making this up, homeboy goes to his palace, lays down on his bed, and pouts. Pouts. I mean, and you think, wait, 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 is this one of those childhood kings? Like, is he one of those three-year-old kings? No, he's a grown dang man, okay? The Bible says he's sulking as he's laying in his bedroom, and he will not eat. He's like bemoaning. And then his lovely wife, Jezebel. Like, you know why we don't name women Jezebel anymore? Because of this woman right here, okay? Like, we don't name people Judas, and we don't name people Jezebel, all right? Jezebel comes in and goes, honey, what's going on? I mean, baby doll, what's the problem here? And he's like, Naboth is being mean to me. <laughs> he's like, what do, what do you mean? He says, well, I wanted to, to buy his vineyard. I wanted to buy his garden. I said, I'd trade him a better garden for it, and he don't want to do it. Jezebel looks at her husband and says, rhetorical question, who's the king in Israel? I thought it was you. Why don't you just take it? She says, don't relax. Just, just, you just listen. You go eat something, wash up, I'll handle this. And boy, did she. The Bible says in the opening parts of chapter 21 that she took some letters and she wrote them in King Ahab's name, rolled them up, stamped them with his signet ring seal, and mailed them to the elders, to the leaders, the people who should know better in the town of Jezreel. It said, listen, y'all throw a fast, I'll throw a feast, 
And then make sure you give Naboth, you know, Naboth, the one with the cool vineyard, give him like a seat of honor, put him up front, you know, where everybody can see him, but then take a, take a couple of thugs. Put one on his left, put one on his right, surround him with these two worthless, vile cretins. And have those two guys say, I, I, I heard Naboth curse the God and, and curse the king. And you take him outside the city limit sign and you stone him to death. And that's exactly what happened. They took Naboth, put him up front, surrounded him by a couple of troublemakers. The troublemakers said, their line's right on cue. Naboth, probably scared to death, was led out of the city to his death. I want to be crystal clear. Naboth was not killed because he was sinful. He was not killed because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was killed because a man and a woman, a king and a queen, used their authority, used their power, used their influence and their platform to bring about injustice. But somebody was watching. Let me read to you the conclusion of the story. Beginning in verse 17, it should be on the screen in case you want to follow along in your Bibles. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite and said, Arise, you go down to meet King Ahab of Israel who is in Samaria. Behold, oh, I love this, underline this in your Bible. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth where he has gone to take possession. And you're going to say to him, thus says the Lord. I love when God says, God says, God says. Okay? Like pay attention because God says, God says. Have you killed and also taken possession? And you say to him, thus says the Lord. In the place, whoo, this gets graphic. In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick upon your own blood. And then Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O oh my enemy? I'll explain that in a second. And he answered, oh, I found you because you have sold yourself to do what's evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And I'll explain that in a second. For the anger which you have provoked me and because you have made all of Israel to sin. Oh, and Jezebel, the Lord says also, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who does in the city, dies in the city, um, the dog shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat like its own, says God. Right? I mean, this is what we're at. Just really quickly, if you don't know who Elijah was... Um, a powerful prophet. God is doing mighty miracles through Elijah. Everybody in the land would have known who Elijah the prophet was. Everybody, of course, would have known who Ahab was. And I love it when God says, go on down and you meet Ahab. He's standing in the vineyard of Naboth. Like, I love that, that God didn't forget whose, whose vineyard it was. Like, I know that you've got a deed, Ahab, but it's written in blood. It belongs to my son, Naboth. All right, so let's just jump in here. We're talking about justice here, right? So let's just jump in here, and I'll, I'll try to teach you this. God's justice, I think it includes and defends the nobodies of the world. Somebody say amen. Like, that's good news. Because Naboth is about as big a nobody as you can get. He's not an official. He's not a leader. He's not a priest. He's not a Levite. We know nothing about this guy except he owned a field. He lived in Jezreel, and he was murdered. That's it. There's, there's like, that's all you get. And so God just jumps in here and begins to defend Naboth. He rushes in and goes, no, 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 I'm going to right this wrong. And I'm left with asking myself, like, why? Like, God, why did, you, why, why did you come rushing out to help a guy? We don't know his last name, don't know who his daddy was, don't know anything about this guy, except he's dead. Why? And I'm left with two answers. The first one, sorry, I'll be the preacher in the room. It's called God love Naboth. But, but I mean, honestly, though, let's just be fair. Let's be, on, let's be theologically accurate. Let's be biblically true. God loves everybody. And I would say this, and this hurts my mouth when I say it, but God... If I understand the scriptures right, God loved Ahab and he loved Jezebel. Just pause for a second. I um, went, met a church member yesterday for some lunch. 
And when our tacos came to the table, I said, hey, why don't you pray for us? And so our brother, we, you know, kind of bowed our head, closed our eyes, and he began to pray. He's like, Lord, thank you for the tacos. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. God, please be, you know, God, please be in, you know, the midst of this tragedy going on in Afghanistan. God, please be with our brothers and sisters, those who call Jesus the Christ, you know. And God, even, like, Lord, lead those Taliban fighters to, to your grace and mercy, and up until that point, I've been like, amen, yeah, Lord, amen. And you got to that part, I'm like, whoa, hold on now. Just, I'm just being, oh, just, and I'm, no, I need to be reminded. Maybe if you're here tonight, you need to be reminded too. That God loves them. He loves them like he loved Ahab and he loved Jezebel. So God brings love but he also brings justice. He rushes in and he, out of his love, says, I'm going to bring justice to Naboth's story because God has to bring justice. You can't call God a God of justice, and that's what he is, if he only gives justice to the rich or only gives justice and help to the influential or just gives justice to the powerful or just gives justice to the people who carry their King James Version only Bibles to church on Sunday morning and Sunday school. No, no, no. You've, he's got to be a God of justice that brings justice to the weak, the poor, the helpless, the fatherless, the uninfluential, the unimportant, the nobodies. And that's exactly what Naboth is. So just let me encourage you before we move on. If you're here tonight, you're like, dude, ain't nothing special. I'm just a guy, I'm just a gal who just comes to church. I, I, I work a job 45 hours a week. I just try to pay the bills, try to keep the family together. Hallelujah, you are loved by God enough that he wants to rush into your story and bring justice. We're all a bunch of nobodies before the Lord. We're all a bunch of Naboths before him. If you're not like the CEO of your company, it's okay because God is in a mighty love for you and with you, okay? So just want to kind of encourage you with that. And so God, seeing the story plays out, rushes in to provide justice for Naboth. And here's why. He's got a perfect track record to protect. I mean, God's track record of Doling out justice, doling out mercy, and doling out justice is perfect. But not just his track record. I actually want you to understand this too, that God's justice is absolutely perfect as well. Now, I, I want to ask you a question. You can, you can actually, if you want to, you can answer out loud. Um, what would you have done? Uh, like, like, you hear about this story. What would you have done to Ahab? What, what would you have done to, to Jezebel? Anybody, you think about it, you internalize it, shout out your answer if you want to. Like, what, what would you have done if you witnessed this travesty take place, this tragedy go down? What would you have done? See, I, I just, I, I'll, I'll answer my own question. I think that you and I, if we're not very careful, we, we would have done nothing because we we're afraid. Dude, he's the king. He's the king. I don't want what to happen to me. What happened to Naboth? I just, I'll walk away and not say anything. So we might have been tempted to just do nothing. We might have been tempted to just run in and be like, oh, um, you know what? For your past sins, we're going to punish you. But actually, what God's going to do is going to take care of future sins as well. He's going to protect those who have not even yet been born. Maybe we rush in and we only punish the guilty Ahab and we forget about how guilty Jezebel was. In other words, we want to rush in, we want to do something, but we might do the wrong thing. I've been thinking about it all week. Well, actually, for the past two weeks, like, what would I do? I'm like, I don't know. If I was in Afghanistan, what would I do? But I don't know, but it would involve some Navy SEALs, you know? I'm just, I'm just being honest. But then I go, I don't know. I don't think that's where the Lord wants my heart. I don't think that's where he wants me. I, I, I think we're, where we're supposed to be is trusting in him. And, and his justice is perfect, even if we don't understand it. And I'll just confess to you, I don't always understand why God does what God does or, or maybe even why God does what God does the way he does it. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't always understand. 
Because I don't, I don't know, I, I asked him a moment ago, raise your hand if you, if you know Naboth, and, and, and not many people did. But, but just real quick, raise your hand if you know King Ahab. Anybody know the story of King Ahab? Anybody know? Come on, raise your hand if you know. Okay, half of you guys. Great, great, great. This guy should have never made it into 1 Kings chapter 21. He's introduced to us in chapter 16. Like, that's enough right there. Because um, I, I, I think, well, let me just, this is the reputation that Ahab has right here in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. This is how we're introduced to this cat, okay? It says, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. By the way, go back and look at all who were before him. There were some pretty wicked cats up in there, okay? And he's bested them. So, okay, let me just burn down the list here real quick. First of all, he sits up false idols and worship shrines for Baal, okay? The false god Baal. Then, if that's not enough, he, he adopts this lovely wife, Jezebel, who brings in her love of the goddess Asherah. So he erects a pole for Asherah. He leads the entire nation of Israel, the northern part of God's kingdom, to worship false gods. And he also allows 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah to run around the land misleading the people. Again, guys, I think any of those reasons is enough for God to roll in with thunder and lightning bolts, okay? And yet he doesn't. And so what we're left with here is going, why didn't you act then? God, why are you acting? There was a whole nation on the line. Just one dude. Nothing Heaven thunders. What's up? Um, I, I think there's lots of applications that we can take away from this story. I do, but let me just center on one. And that's this, is that God's power, God's justice, it'll reach to the highest halls of leadership. That there's not a leader in the world, on this planet, whether he is in the White House or he is in Beijing or he is in Moscow, it doesn't matter. God will reach up and tear down as is required. And so I, I think we should pray for our leaders, but also think we should just realize and recognize that they are put in their place. They are allowed to be where they are, men and women, by God's sovereignty. And if they are unjust, God in his same sovereignty will yank them out. He will take them out. And so, um, I, I think a lot of us, I'm just, maybe just me, you say, I just want to get my hands on Ahab. I, I want to get my hands on these Taliban fighters. I want to get my hands on these bad guys. I, I want to do this. I want to do that. But what I think we need to do is trust the Lord. That's what we have to do. And that's tough because sometimes he's quiet when we want him to be loud. But we need to trust the Lord. Now, does that mean, Pastor David, we shouldn't do anything? Does that mean that we just shouldn't do, uh, say anything? Does it mean we shouldn't take action? We just kind of should sit back and just let the, the big eat the little? We should let the harsh eat the meek? What, what, what are you saying? Like, we don't take any action? We don't do anything? Uh, that ain't what I said at all. Let me be very careful on what I say. All right, this is where we wrap up. I'll put it to you like this. I think God's justice demands our participation in it. Let me ask you a very simple question. The easiest question I'll probably ever ask you. Did God need Elijah to deal with Ahab? Yes or no? Like a heck no. He's sovereign God. He's, Ahab's the king, and God as we know him in Isaiah is the king of kings, okay? So no, God didn't quote unquote need Elijah but he did call Elijah to go and get in Ahab's face. So what are we to be left with here? I just want to point out what Elijah did. Elijah went and he talked to the king. He went and he opened his mouth. He went and he said words. Specifically, he said the words that God told him to say. He got in his face. He got confrontational. He called him out. And that's a good thing. And, and that's what God called Elijah to do. So what Elijah should have done, okay? Let me tell you what God, Elijah didn't do. God's prophet didn't do. He didn't roll in with a Louisville slugger. 
okay? He, he wasn't strapped with a 357 Magnum. He, he didn't do like the, the Dirty Harry, do you feel lucky, punk? Well, do you? I mean, he didn't do any of that. He just rolled in and he said exactly what God told him to say. So, so here's what I would say to you. We, as we see, as we witness injustice, we need to do exactly what God tells us to do. So sometimes it may be, hey, speak up and say something. Hey, stand up and do something. But whatever that is, I believe it has to be, has to be what the Lord wants. I've, I've thought for the past 12 days, What's the solution? How do we fix this? And I keep coming back to the same wrong answer. And it's, it's just the wrong answer. I'm like, well, just exact vengeance, God. And, and I'm, I'm being biblical here. I mean, you said vengeance is yours, God, so just take it all. If you want to bring us in on us, fine, like I say, you know. But the problem is, the problem is, is I'm no better. Let me just be, let me be perfectly clear with you. I'm no better. The, 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 pro the problem with me is I make a terrible judge because I'm just as corrupt. I'm just as sinful. I've got just the same dark heart as these people, as this king. And so I thank God that he's the perfect judge. He's the perfect, just judge. So, so what... Elijah says to him, catch this, is he says, Ahab, you're going down, sucker. You, not only are you going to die, but the Lord is going to cut off every male in your household. Y your son's going to die. Your son's son is going to die. Your male servant's sons are going to die. I'm going to rub the earth of your remembrance because you are wicked your sons are wicked. Their sons are going to be wicked. And I've quite frankly had enough of dealing and mopping up your mess. You're through. You're through. And so what eventually happens, if you read the last couple chapters of 1 Kings and the first, at least the first chapter, maybe two chapters of 2 Kings, is God does just that over some time. But here's, here's the part I don't, I didn't read it to you, but I, Quit laughing at me, MJ. <laughs> I didn't read it to you, but I think you should know how, I think you should know the whole story. I stopped reading to you in verse 27, I think. The very next line, the very next passage, <sighs> this is what it talks about. It says, Ahab heard the word of the Lord, this wicked, murderous king. By the way, you know how many times Ahab and Jezebel had personally tried to kill Elijah, and Elijah never takes vengeance upon him. He had plenty of reason to kill this guy, and didn't. God comes back to Elijah and says, hey, did you hear what this dude did? Did you hear what Ahab said? Did you see what he, did you see what he did? He tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth, this itchy, scratchy, repentance kind of cloth, and and he, and he held a fast, and he, and he humbled himself, and God says, I caught that. This wicked, vile, cruel man who's murdered for grapes, he humbled himself. So I'm going to stay my hand. And it won't, what I'm going to do to him is not going to happen in his life. He won't see it. It'll happen to his children. I'm like, God, can we talk about that? And yet that's the forgiveness. That's the mercy of our God. So I'm going to wrap up here, and let me just, let me just kind of close and say this. Um, I guess perhaps we're all in one of two camps tonight. Um, if, you're the, if you're the Naboth in here, and you've been beat up, you've been chewed up, you've been spit out, you've been run through the ringer, you, you're the one who knows that your boss is cheating the customers. You, you know that your, your manager's cheating the other employees. You, you know that your, your brother-in-law is doing this to your mother. Whatever the situation may be, you're the neighbor. Let me give you good news. God sees. 
God is just, and his justice is perfect. But, but there may be some Ahabs in here tonight. I know that's tough to say, but let's deal with the whole truth. Maybe you are the offender. Maybe you are the one who is unjust. Maybe you are the one who is taking. Maybe you are the one who is stealing. Maybe you are the one who is hurting others. I love you, but just know that God is batting a thousand when it comes to justice. And there's not going to be anyone who escapes his hand. And just like this story ends, all, I didn't read it to you. I believe that if you bow your will, you bow your heart, you confess your sin to the Lord and say, I'm an Ahab, I'm a sinner. I have served injustice my life. Forgive me. This is what I believe. This is what I believe. I believe that the Lord who is just, who is mighty in justice, is equally mighty in mercy, and he will grant forgiveness. And so, whichever one of those camps that you might happen to be in tonight, if you're the Naboth and you just need some encouragement, man, just come see me or grab one of our leaders here. Don't leave without just crawling into a corner with them, burying your head and your heart in God's word and, and, and praying. Don't leave here suffering alone, okay? But if you're here tonight and you're the Naboth, uh, the, the, the Ahab, and brother, my sister, listen, my friend, you need to humble yourself. You need to bow before the Lord before he comes in and scorches because that's what's going to happen to those who do not repent. Let me pray for you.